All right, so question number one, what the heck is emerging media, right? It's a very, very vague, very, very broad term, and so I really wanted to understand what is the scope and scale, what, how do we get our arms around this term if you're talking about doing interventions to further equality? And so I'm gonna quickly talk about a broad overview of what came up. Um, at New Frontier, at Sundance, we've been looking at artists that are pushing the boundaries of storytelling, mostly at the intersection of technology, science and art for 12 years now. And the lens with which we try to follow the artists is by understanding that story doesn't exist unless it, unless it has been heard. So there's something in that transfer process that the emotions, the ideas, um, the human condition stuff has to be shared with your audience or with your participants, with your co-collaborators, in order for story to exist. So we look at that communication architecture um, where story exists in that medium, and we follow the artists that are hacking into it and inventing it, quite literally, um, to understand where they're, where they're finding um, success um, creating resonant and meaningful story. And sometimes that success comes through failure. Um, we also are really interested in the relationship, when we talk about making a new reality, we very much believe and have seen over the course of the existence of Sundance in general, but New Frontier specifically, the relationship between imagination, innovation, and manifestation. So storytelling and the process that catalyzes our imagination, I think is very specifically connected to what becomes our reality, both from a technological standpoint as well as from a cultural, sociological standpoint. Um, for example, one of our artists, uh, Alex McDowell and Dr. John Underkoffler worked together with a collaborative design process around the story, the, uh, story world of minor Minority Report many, many years ago. Um, and that collaborative design process, which included both artists, creative technologists, and scientists, and people that had specific expertise around what does it mean to develop a city of the future, um, through that process, they came up with ideas and visions that we all got to see from our theater screens many years ago. But since then, they have created 100 patents have come out of that process. So we're really talking about a very specific relationship between imagination and manifestation. And we also know that socially and culturally, if you look at implicit bias research and so forth, we also have a very specific relationship with story. Um, another, another one of our artists, uh, the godfather of projection mapping, has 11 patents in this. Um, medium and so on. And many of our artists kind of have had to engineer technology to realize their robust creative and imaginatory visions. So another thing about that idea is, so this is one of the technologies that came out that was patented and it was a gestural based relationship with editing film that we showed back in 2007 at New Frontier. And I, I love the relationship between this kind of imaginative process that leads to realization of a very functional technology, and then how that loops back around to something that is creative expression and poetic. So using that similar technology, Chris Milk created Treachery of Sanctuary, which was a triptych, um, a poem about the nature and, and the dynamics of creativity. Um, so what are those categories that we found um, that particularly this group of people defined emerging media as? Well, tactile-based media was one of them. As much as we're trying to become digital and be in virtual spaces, we still very much have bodies with lizard brains that want to, that have an emotional relationship to touch. So projects like Hue or this one, Evolution of Fearlessness, this is a piece where Lynette Walworth interviewed 10 women that had been through some of the worst atrocities in the human condition from Holocaust to genocide, rape, war. And she had in the exhibition a book where you could read their stories in plain old paper. And then you walked up to a door frame in a black screen. You put your hand on the black screen and through a randomized algorithm, one of those women in a digital representation of them life size would walk up to you and put their hand on your hand. And that messed people up. So we're, we're seeing as much as artists are trying to push into this virtual space with haptics, with touch screens, there's still something about this that we really want to still engage the physical body and unleash ways that the emotional resonance can connect. Obviously, interactive film and interactive books are taking a lot of lessons from uh, interactive design in general um, and are finding ways to not just do branching narrative or give agency, but they're also finding ways to maintain cinematic fluidity, which is a huge step, I think, um, for interactive film. 
Um, we're seeing, obviously, the continual hybridization and finding the why of that hybrid, that convergence of um, mediums. Uh, this piece, 1979 Revolution, which went on to win a nomination, BAFTA uh, nomination, was trying to understand the best of gaming and the best of documentary. How can you give that deep historical context but still make a modern day person become complicit in history, having to make moral survival and political choices in the fog of war and then have to live through the consequences to have more empathy with those decisions that people had to make in that fog in history. We're seeing, um, you know, the continuation of cosplay and immersive theater escape rooms obviously is still a big part of how we're playing with design and story. Participatory story is still huge. This, this project still has 500,000 active co crowdsourced um, creators making work that some of it goes to the Super Bowl, <laughs> and they have an interesting profit-sharing model for artists. Um, transmedia storytelling continues to be actually the norm, I think, at this point, um, especially in the marketing space. Uh, nothing lives within a single platform, and, and story is fragmented across platform. Omnidirectional, the continual breakage of the linear narrative, um, the, pl the playing between you know, text-based and rich, rich media, geolocative media, like this novel that played across the United States um, in really robust ways and created participatory story. Geo-aware, um, things like this composition, um, the National Mall, it was a symphony that you could experience in 400 par parallel ways, depending on how you meandered through the National Mall. One point you might hear the violins, one place the timpanis, and in the obelisk you heard the entire orchestra come in with a, qu with a choir. So continue to understand how landscape and geolocative stories can be meaningful and resonant. We're seeing um, ephemeral media was something that I hadn't quite considered, but it came up a couple of times where, especially 13, 14, and under, are really interested in things that don't have permanency. Um, being a generation that has been tracked since birth on Facebook, they're interested in things that can disappear and understand what liveness is again. Um, what does it mean to have something that has a scarcity in time? Um, we're seeing you know, projection mapping and immersive theater continue to find new heights of interest. And then this is an interesting one, data visualization. We all are familiar with that. It's part of, like, especially in journalism, it's one of the key parts of the toolbox for storytelling um, in journalism. But I find it interesting that that is now moving from visualization on a screen to something called ambient data storytelling, where objects in the Internet of Things and the wired environments become points of your relationship with those data stories. This is a lantern that was made by the Afrofuturist Library in Brooklyn called the Ayapo Repository that when you walk around New York City, it lights up whenever it passes a point that a black person has been killed by a police officer. There are no screens. It's fully embodied, and that, but yet it's completely connected to our data infrastructure that's invisible and all around us. Um, this is a Twitter table that when the light comes up on the knob, you know, and some hashtag with a particular photo, with a photo attached, you just open the drawer and there's an analog print picture. So again, what is the future of storytelling when the canvas that the digital age is empowering can be very analog as well and be all around us? Um, we are, uh, anyone experienced this famous death at Future Storytelling a couple of years ago? Okay, we got one. <laughs> Um, where smell and like the whole smell of vision thing, people are coming back. This is where you can experience the last moments of JFK's life or um, Whitney Houston's life through sound and smell only. Very effective from what I understand. I don't know if you would agree, sir, back there. Yeah, okay. Um, and then what is the relationship with storytellers and characters when the characters don't stay put on a single screen, right? So you have Arcade, reflect, uh, Arcade Fire did just a reflector with one of our artists where you can manipulate the light with your phone if you download the app, and then at the end of the video, the protagonist falls into your phone and your image falls into the screen. So you kind of flip perspectives and now you become immersed as a character in the story and they fall into your phone. How do storytellers play with that kind of canvas when the characters themselves won't stay put? And then we got the whole immersive media, right? So we've showcased 360 film, you know, helped to launch Eve Valkyrie in the gaming space. We're seeing these incredible, new um, evolutions of storytelling craftsmanship in VR, um, in especially around full body hyper reality where your entire self is engaged. We're seeing new levels of ways in which storytelling is uh, where there's kind of a native 
um, VR native approach to storytelling, not just replicating previous forms. Obviously, volumetric capture, performance, full embodiment, real-time performance with the new real-time rendering that's happening with those breakthroughs. Um, we're seeing shared social VR, so shared screening, um, you know, things like your experience in the VR world is like this, in the real world it's like this, where there's incredible engagement um, with your fellow, fellow participants. Uh, light field technology will really be a huge game changer as that continues to evolve and get cheaper in terms of cost of production. Um, augmented reality, the early days, seeing how that evolves. This is an opera that will be playing out all over New York City with, through AR. Um, obviously, the early days of, and now we're seeing Magic Leap DK uh, developers kits start to show up in the creator community. HoloLens. This is one of the best Microsoft HoloLens pieces I've ever seen, where the dancers fall out of the sky. You can land on your hand. You can push them back up. They come out of the ground. They become room scale. It's a really beautiful piece by Melissa Painter. And now, artificial intelligence and the relationship between co-creation with smart um, with smart computers. So generative art where the artist is constantly co-creating with the, with the algorithm. You guys saw this, the first, uh, one of the first screenplays written by an AI, which is hilarious. Um, artists playing with the idea of the human interface where as much as the AI becomes part of our world, how do we still remain human-centered? Is the future of work human beings being that interface to remain grounded in what it means to be human? Um, this is a piece we showed, an AR piece that also has an AI engine where the AI is growing through um, eating our emotions. Um, Frankenstein AI, another social AI that was birthed and developed through interaction with our community at Sundance. Um, and then puppeted a performance of a dancer, projection mapping, uh, drums. It was quite intense based on our human emotions. And the future of memoir, ancestral AI, how do we, through the power of natural language processing and these powerful algorithms um, be able to remain in conversation with our, with our elders as, as society evolves. And then now going into the physical body. How are we playing? I'm gonna try to do this faster. I know I'm running out of time. Um, so we have, this is a game we showed back in 2007, which is you know, uh, using our biolog biological metrics in relationship to gameplay. We have, Yehuda Duenas did a piece where your biometric responses helped to, um, you basically had to game the system that the calmer you could keep your, your biology, the more hyper the system and the higher you rose, trying to enact a sense of zen, how we can remain centered in the middle of chaos. We have the fact that we are becoming more cyborgonian. How can we use this as a canvas for storytelling? We actually have cyborgs out there. Look this guy's work out, up, it's pretty amazing. Um, and then even our DNA is becoming part of the media landscape. This is a piece by Heather Dewey Hagborg where she found strangers' DNA on the streets of New York City, analyzed it, and made 3D replications of their faces, um, which has really significant implications when you think about facial recognition. Um, you should really look up her work. She's phenomenal. And then how DNA itself it will become potentially the storage container for media you guys all know about this uh, piece that was encoded. So what does that mean for the future of media? So these are the questions we're trying to ask. We're trying to deal with that landscape around equality and public space and democratized media, right? So that's pretty insane to try to think about. Um, and of course, the robots are coming, are here. Um, I have a very optimistic view about the future, I'll, although I do see the need for intervention in order to avoid some of the black mirror <laughs> dystopian realities that we could could come out of this innovation and new superhuman capability. Um, I'm gonna get past this stuff, because uh, I'm running out of time. But, and I, you know, obviously there's a lot of business here, a lot of saturation, especially around the Internet of Things, which is the mama of it all. Um, but what are the concerns? So in 20, this is, I think, the call to action that best sums up what I found. The progress of racial justice and the development of technologies are not linear. Every time you develop a new technology, you need to have a thought process about the history and systems of oppression that that technology is being created and released into. Think about the ways 
to bend the technology to justice and not allow it to replicate, entrench, and worsen injustice. And that is the call to action that we all have to do in this community that cares about XR for good and emerging media for good. We need to be able to see where those blind spots are. So I was at the birth of this second wave of VR innovation, at least from an from a industry standpoint. I was in the room when Palmer Lucky showed the first prototype of the Rift at New Frontier in 2012. And I was part, it was very exciting. It was like probably what it felt like to be hanging out with Steve Jobs and, and, uh, and, and the, the Apple team back in the early days. Um, and then I got to go to the first Oculus Developers Conference, which was, again, very exciting. But when I walked in the room, out of 150,000 people who had a DK1 kit or a DK2 kit, there were only 1,000 that were hand-picked, and maybe I saw 30 women. And being a woman of color, also very few people of color, I had this immediate reaction of like, oh, I want to go sit at the Starbucks, and I felt very uncomfortable. Um, but then I forced myself to go into the room and I shook hands and I was welcomed and everyone was like, yeah, I was like super excited. We're going to change the world feeling. But in the plenary session, a woman from LEVR, V Heart, got up and said, oh, what are we going to do about the apparent gender gap? Now, I want to be clear, this was a long time ago and Oculus is making a lot of strides to change those gender gaps. And I know a lot of women in there that are doing incredible work. But at the moment, the attitude was, this is a meritocracy. We just have to hire the best of the best. We can't play gender politics. And that was what was said from the stage. And anybody that was in there as a woman, it was a sucker punch to the gut, that idea of the meritocracy argument, which is so prevalent in Silicon Valley. I believed it. I believed that the reason that this set of people were able to be in a position to be the leaders of innovation is because they had resources. And that was why they were able to be at the forefront, that they had a privileged advantage in terms of just a starting line that was further up than people with pipeline issues and educational issues. And then when I dive deeper and scratch the surface of that mythology, I realized that that's absolutely not true and that every point of innovation, you will see that it's actually the cross-pollination of diverse thoughts and people that actually spark those innovations. From film with Oscar Micheaux, black man who made 40 films, Social media, the first person to ever create a social media website being a black man named Omar Wasso. Looking at Grace Hopper or any of the women that were at the dawn of coding. And I realized that that meritocracy argument is a dangerous argument to make. So I went to Sepp Kamvar at MIT, dear friend of mine at the birth of Google search engine. And he said, code is the new superpower. The superpower creates the social process. And the social process literally makes our world. It makes our reality. And if you look at Uber and green spaces or food trucks and Twitter, he gave lists and lists of, of ways in which our social process, Airbnb, can change based on those codes. And that scared me when I thought about that experience where I was one of few people in the room, if it's a homogenous group defining what that superpowers code is and defining our social process and therefore making a new reality, what reality will we make? And then I went to Google and I talked to Robert Wong at the Google Creative Lab, and he told me that he feared that we wouldn't be able to find a human-centered future because the artists were marginalized as pairs of hands, and there wasn't true cross-collaboration between the arts, humanities, science, and technology, and engineering. So that, again, made me go, oh my god, there's another place in which this code being the new superpower is being siloed, and we're not finding the optimization of our cross-pollination. And then I went to Oxford at the Skull World Forum, and I met with the head of one of the most powerful tech companies in the world who runs their futures department. And he showed me a video of the future, and it was somewhat soulless. And I asked him, and he was a lovely man, really liked him. And I said, wow, this is really impressive from a technological standpoint, but what about the culture? What about the soul of humanity in that future? I said, do you have anyone from the arts and the humanities helping you to imagine the future? And he said, no. We're all engineers. And he said, that's a blind spot. And when you think about blind spots, does anyone know what happened to the Columbia Space Shuttle? What NASA's number one reason why it crashed or exploded that day? No? The ultimate reason was a lack of diversity of thought, was group think, was siloed thinking, and it was hierarchical thinking. And so I think about that when we're on this trek. And I think about the dawn of film when we had certain value systems 
the very first feature film, and how that 100 and some years later is still impacting the minds and hearts of all of us when we're trying now to desperately rid ourselves of things like implicit bias that make this reality for people every day. I also think about the previous industrial revolutions as we're entering into the fourth industrial revolution. And I think about who was marginalized and not part of the cross-pollination of ideas about how we could use these superhuman capabilities at that time. And I think about the indigenous voices and I think about how Heather Ray says that now we're paying the price for that blind spot and that is climate change. So what blind spots are we having in this cycle of innovation that will lead to something on the scale of climate change that we're gonna have to pay the bill for in 100 years? And I, I will skip past this stuff because I'm now uh, going over. Um, but as Jeremy Bilson said, VR is like uranium. We can do good or we can do bad with it. And I do truly believe that it is that engineering of a robust inclusion of ideas that will help us to find that culture, that reality that we want to find, that we really want to live into. So the list of issues, like, I won't even get into this, but you should read my piece on innovator stereotype and why the women dropped out of computer science in 83, 84, because of storytelling that we were t telling about that they didn't belong. Um, but the list of, you know, all of these issues that came up around, um, you know, what, I, won't, I can't get into all this, sorry, gave, but it's just a lot of stuff, right? <laughs> a lot, a lot of things that people, and I was like, oh my God, this is depressing. I'm so miserable. How do we overcome all this stuff in order to find our optimal future? And then I was walking on the streets of Oxford with my colleague from Sundance, Tabitha Jackson. I was like, ah, oh, this is dystopian. How are we going to, you know, push back? And she goes, you know, it hasn't happened yet. And I was like, yes! <laughs> I was like, we can Jane Jacobs this thing. Um, and I think about Jane Jacobs, and although she was dealing with the pressure of New York City's Robert Moses and thinking of you know, these incredible plans, and I'm not taking anything away from the aspects of the design of New York City that Robert Moses brought, but I do think about his blind spots and how Jane Jacobs was essential to pushing back on those blind spots. She said, no, please keep Washington Square Park. Can we please keep green space instead of this being a, a, a freeway that demolishes the idea of projects, the things that have become blind spots that still have urban blight and create redlining and economic disparities in the city. We now have this history to stand on. We can't have the same excuses of the past of not knowing that we know what the cycle of disruption can cause in terms of inequity. And we also now understand where and how those interventions can be mitigated through inclusion and diversity of thought. So the interventions that were discovered were very much around mitigating bias, around groupthink mitigation, and around policies and infrastructures just to check and balance ourselves. And one of those things was designing for public space. And this is the last thing I'll say, and I know I'm three minutes over, but I have to say this one. Um, when Just Films director Kara Mertes came to me and she asked me to do this research, she said, when television was an emerging medium, we saw that it was all commercial. And so it was in the halls of Ford that we said, we need to intervene and create public space to create space for the democracy, democracy uh, the citizen to be informed, to be part of a democracy. And they intervened and helped to start the field, they, the, they catalyzed the field to move towards public television and we got PBS. And they said, we were 25 years too late and all we got was PBS. So we want you to find out where we need to intervene now so we're not 25 years too late in these new mediums. That's really different than a broadcast single channel. Like, I think we had like 12 channels back then. What the heck does that mean in this infrastructure? Well, you just saw the scope and scale. It's very complicated, very fragmented. Um, and so we talked, some people said, well, we're still trying to intervene in Web 1.0, where the UN says that internet is a, is a human right. How are we just getting the internet to people? Then we're trying to intervene in Web 2.0, where we're playing defense just around basic ideas of human rights around privacy, transparency, and, um, and knowing how our data is being used, not to create filter bubbles and economic and echo chambers, right? So we're still playing defense on Web 2.0. Well, we're entering into Web 3.0, which is the immersive web, where we have not only virtualized XR uh, interfaces with data and communications media in the world, but we also have every single object around us will become part of that, in, in, that internet infrastructure. H how are we intervening here? We have billions and billions of dollars already being put into this infrastructure and it's showing up in our homes and maybe we, it's still time there. And others are saying, no, we have to intervene in web 4.0, which is the ultra intelligent web where you have your personal AI, you have your community AI, and that's only, that's the only place where we might be able to have a chance to intervene. 
I don't know that answer, but these are the questions that we as a community of media makers for good, interactive media makers for good, we have to answer those questions. So I invite you to look at the research and to join the conversation. I won't go into the framework for action right now because it's pretty cool, but this is the website, makingnewreality.org, and we are open to people writing response articles, so please join the conversation. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.